Hello everyone, my name is uh, Federico Tozzi. I'm the executive director of the ILI America Chamber of Commerce. First of all, let me welcome all of you for today's uh, Masterclass Bootcamp, which uh, is focusing on uh, the Veneto region. As you know, this is a program that is uh, supported and financed by the Italian uh, uh, Foreign Affairs Ministry and coordinated by our association in Italy, Asso Camera Estero and uh, is a program that is also done by other uh, sister chamber, both in the United States and all over the world. The focus of the program, of course, is to promote authentic Italian products, and we have decided to do that, talking every, every time um, for a different region. Uh, probably some of you have already participated to the previous one, which uh, uh, focused on Lombardy and uh, Emilia Romagna, and today the focus is Veneto. So first of all, I would like to thank our host, uh, Middleby Residential, and especially Jackie Ratong. Uh, she is the brand manager for Biking, one of the brands of Middleby Residential. She's also a chef, and she's going to be guiding us through this uh, culinary journey. I would like to thank also Francesco Lupo. He's a food educator, has been with us for a while, so you already know him. And today we have a, a, a new chef, a new Italian chef in New York, Riccardo Orfino. Riccardo is a, is a very good friend of mine. He's been uh, uh, very close to the uh, Italy America Chamber of Commerce, supporting us in uh, several initiatives. He has uh, two restaurants in New York, Osteria 57, and he recently opened a new one called the Alice Restaurant. But uh, you're going to hear uh, directly from them all, uh, um, all these things and the cool stuff that they're doing. So I'm done, and uh, I would like <laughs> <laughs> Jackie to take over. Yes. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for the introduction, Federico. Thank you. I am Chef Jackie Rothong. I am the brand ambassador and chef for Middleby Residential and Viking. Um, and so pretty much what does that mean, and what's my background? What kind of qualifies me? I feel like we're, we should step up. Um, what kind of quality, let's get to the kitchen, guys. Um, what kind of qualifies me to be a part of this? And I have an interesting background. I actually come from the television world. I used to run a kitchen for a show called The Chew on ABC, and it was a live TV show, so it was, there was a lot of action, there was a lot of crazy things going on, um, but I had the opportunity to cook a lot of different cuisines. And I think that's what makes me unique to this group, because I love Italian food, I've traveled to Italy many times, and I have a lot of great experience and a lot of great memories going to Italy. Um, but I'm just a New Jersey gal, and I'm from America, and uh, I make pasta all the time, but there's so many things I'm learning and discovering about the different regions of Italy that I love sharing with people, and I, of course, love learning, because the day you stop learning is just, it's not a good day. You're always learning something great. So today I'm going to be making a, a champagne, which we're going to talk about champagne, guys, because champagne and Prosecco in America are kind of the same thing to me, but that, I am incorrect, according to the Italians. According to my Italian friends, I'm incorrect. So I want to learn about that, and I want to kind of correct myself there. So I'm actually making a Prosecco uh, roasted risotto, and it's going to be quite delicious. I'm very excited to share it with you. Um, Francesco, I want to talk to Francesco. We want to we want to learn about Francesco, why he's here with us today, what he's going to be explaining to us today, and uh, what we're going to take away. Well, my name is Francesco Lupo. I am an uh, imported food specialist. Uh, my specialty is to bring uh, DOP products out of Italy. Um, when we talk about DOP, is uh, items that are geographically um, defined uh, and they're very unique to the area where they came from. Uh, what I do during my uh, my week is uh, uh, find new products, uh, travel when it was possible to travel, uh, and bring product into the U.S. Uh, from a wonderful uh, cheese from the Veneto region uh, to the Viola Renano from uh, uh, Isola La Scala uh, to uh, the Radicchio di Castelfranco. Uh, Wonderful. That's great. I think uh, that Francesco does uh, the best job in the world. Like, go around and find the new products, <laughs> taste, bring here. Amazing. I really. couldn't agree more. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Guys, we have such a special guest with us today, Chef Ricardo. He is the owner of Osteria 57, which I had the pleasure of eating at. And it is fish and vegetable based restaurant. It was fantastic. You do not miss an ounce of meat when you're there. So, welcome. And tell us about 
you know, your background, what you're going to be making for us today. Sure. First of all, thank you. Thank you, Jackie, to host me. Thank you, the Italian American Chamber. I'm very happy to be here uh, and uh, to talk about my beautiful region, which I miss a lot, uh, especially in these days. Uh, so I'm Riccardo Orfino. Uh, I'm from uh, Padova, which is in Veneto. And uh, I'm a chef partner here in New York uh, um, for uh, um, Alice and uh, Osteria 57 restaurants. So we are here today because uh, we're going to, as Jackie said, present some uh, uh, dishes. And today I'm going to prepare uh, a dish called uh, pasticcio, which uh, can be translated to lasagna with the Castelfranco radicchio and uh, Asiago cheese. Yum. That sounds really good. I'm <laughs> really excited you. about We're gonna that. Try. Yeah. It sounds so good. Um, so I actually had never heard of that before. Pa pasticcio? Yes, yes. That's a good, uh, good question, Jackie. Because uh, um, we usually call uh, uh, pasticcio the type of pasta, the baked pasta that is made uh, usually in South, uh, South Italy, because they used to mix uh, not only um, fresh pasta, sheet of pasta and ground meat, as usually we do with lasagna bolognese, but they add uh, a lot of different ingredients inside. So, of course, every family have a different recipe, and this is the beauty, I think, of Italy, because there is not, uh, uh, there is not uh, a real... Uh, um, kitchen for every region. I love to say that uh, there, is a, there is a recipe for every family. So every family have his own recipe to prepare things. And this is beautiful. Um, but yes, so in Veneto we call pasticcio. Uh, but technically, it's nothing mixed uh, really together as uh, they do in uh, southern I Italy. But it's, uh, uh, you're going to see it's very light out. So it's going to be made as a classic lasagna. But we call pasticcio. I love that. So. That's a great explanation because there's so many things I'm learning from doing these from all the different regions that there are completely different kitchens. I like the way you're saying that. Completely different recipes for the exact same recipe. And here in America, it's like bolognese is kind of just like one thing and it's not truly Italian. Um, so I love learning Absolutely. that there's like all these different recipes and cool things that we can make. So let's get started. Absolutely. Let's great. Let's do it. All right, so we're going to start from our product. So what we need today for make this uh, recipe, of course, is this beautiful uh, uh, Castelfranco radicchio, or we call it Rosa di Castelfranco. But as you can see, Jackie, it looks like a ro rose, like a flower rose. It's gorgeous. So to me, this feels like it's a cross between like a red radicchio and escarole. Absolutely. Is that Absolutely. Um, it actually is. It is? It is. Oh. It is. Oh, and, uh, they had a baby and mm -hmm. they made that. And uh, um, the first time uh, the Radico di Castelfranco was, um, how we can say, created. was created was around uh, uh, 1800. 1800. And this uh, is why this guy's here, <laughs> right here. He's, here. He's got all the facts. So I basi love it. basically, uh, the Radico di Castelfranco is uh, one of those items that defines the terroir because the territory where it grows actually gives the uniqueness of the flavor. Um, plus, uh, is uh, the art of the man uh, creating a product by manipulation of because the color in order to get those that color and oh, wow. it needs to it needs a special process uh, from seedling to uh, harvesting mm -hmm. uh, the interventional man is very important you know uh, they stop the the sun shine to shine in by covering it okay. during the process of harvest you know, the period that is and is growing this is primarily produced in, in autumn is, uh, yeah, autumn is, is the time that it is because okay. it's very delicate. In the winter, it will, will die. So right. it gets uh, uh, cedar, cedar in June and August. Mm -hmm. By September, October, which, you know, by the process is they cover the, the fields right. to maintain humidity and to keep the sun away from uh, all the chlorophyll to, to form, which that's why the, the flavor is actually basically a manipulation by man to give that sweetness okay. to a little slight bitterness which adapts to a lot of recipes from savory to sweet. You can actually make a dessert with, uh, with this item. Yeah, I, I was reading about it actually. Is a panna cotta, is that one of panna the things? Panna cotta is one, panna of, cotta is one uh, of the things that you can make, right? You can actually uh, make a, a sweet lasagna with the uh, ricotta cheese and uh, uh, radicchio di Castelfranco. Uh, this product is, uh, the uniqueness is that at uh, two months, mm -hmm. since it it's sees minimal, Minimal uh, exposure to light. The more light it gets, the more red it gets. Okay. So the lighter it is. If you see, there's two so different that's how colors there. Ripe, They're very right? unique colors. Uh -huh. That means they have two very unique flavors. Okay. That may be a little sweeter than this one, to so, the to the exposure. So here's one of my questions. It's February. 
how are we eating this now here in the United States? Well, because, you know, there's man is advanced in creating, uh -huh. uh, there's uh, uh, farms that like do go environment. control environments all okay. year round. Uh, you know, traditionally years ago, you have cycles where you can only get produce or a specific time of the year, but right. the economy, the global economy asks for a, a specific item we want more at the moment yes mm -hmm. yeah we don't have enough we want everything on demand right now and i think that's the one of the downfalls and good things about america you know i just i just want to point out though it doesn't mean that it's lesser right qu quality. Lesser quality no it's actually the same quality because that's important to know. you know the the final stage of the product are done in an enclosed uh, uh, greenhouse yes. uh, environment mm -hmm. because you know it gets taken out of the uh, from from the soil but in a basically hydroponic system right. that creates the product. That's becoming more and more popular yes. like it across is. the country. Yeah. So walk Absolutely. us through your recipe. Great. So let's doing? back to the recipe. So we need, uh, in order to make this recipe, the Castelfranco Redicchio, uh, some fresh shallots. Here I have already the final product with the Castelfranco Radicchio already braised with the shallots. And uh, then uh, we're going to have to make the bechamel for the lasagna. So we're going to need... Uh, uh, the butter, the milk, uh, the flour, the nutmeg, and also inside the lasagna we're gonna add some uh, Asiago cheese, which is another product that uh, uh, I brought from my beautiful region, Veneto, and... Uh, well, I, like I say, Asiago refines, defines uh, Veneto, because uh, in every uh, recipe uh, you find Asiago cheese in there, plus it, it is a... Uh, uh, and I... Uh, an expression of the territory. Uh, the Veneto region has beautiful uh, uh, grasslands from the Po Valley to the plateau of Asiago where the cows are grazing and uh, what defines the product is uh, uh, the, the milk, where they come from, it's cow's milk. Mm -hmm. um, the location, uh, the terroir of the territorio. Um, what the cows are eating is very important. And what are they <coughs> eating? They're eating actually, um, uh, depending on the time of the year, it could be from the grassland of the Po Valley uh -huh. to uh, the spring and summer when they go to the mountains, flowers, alpine flowers, uh, which they come through through the different ages of the, of the product. And will that influence the flavor of the cheese? Yes, it does. And how long, is there like a limitation on how long the cheese ages? Is it like nine months, 10 months, well, Asiago? Tra it? Traditionally, the ages of Asiago is uh, uh, three ages. You have uh, uh, Pressato, which is young, which is goes from 20 to 60 days. Okay. Then you have Mezzano, that is from 60 to 100 days. Then you have uh, uh, Vecchio, which mm -hmm. goes from 100 to a uh, minimum of, of one year, year and a half. Oh, wow. um, it cannot age more than that because the form is about 15 pounders. So basically we get very dry. Mm -hmm. um, as you can see the different ages, this is a very young, you know, you, the color changes, it's very, the paste is very soft. Mm -hmm. uh, that is wonderful too for applications in cooking, uh, melting. Uh, uh, for sauces, uh, for sandwiches. For it's mac and cheese. For mac and cheese, especially. Cheese. You know, that's a, that's I a feel classic. Like that's very helpful because so many people are like, oh, what kind of cheeses can I use for mac and cheese or can I use for different things? So knowing what like its uses are, it's good too. Because it's a hard cheese, right? Yes. Um, or is it like? It's an R cheese. I mean, depending on the age okay. that you should select, it can be an R cheese. Oh. If you get the level, the pressato, which is about 20 days to 60 days, is very soft. So. Oh. Uh, as he gets older, he acquires the paste, becomes a little crumblier. Uh -huh. um, the f flavors will get defined mm -hmm. because of the, uh, the sugars and everything else. Uh, gets into a sweetness, umami, uh, more of a nuttiness to the flavor. Mm -hmm. uh, and as older he gets, so you want to really use it as in the cheese board or as in grating. Uh, as a chia, uh, as a substitute for grilled uh, cheese to grate for oh the wow. pastas. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I remember. I love to share these memories because I remember when uh, we used to. I com we come from a, a big family, especially in Veneto. It was uh, always uh, Sunday, you know. Everybody goes to the grandmother and grandfather family, and we met all the cousin, all the the family. And uh, I remember that we. We use uh, sometimes the Asiago or the Piave Stravecchio. My, my, my nonna was using that instead of uh, Parmigiano, or Grana Padano, because it uh, was already, you know, in house, it was already aging in our canteen. Yeah, so, yeah. so it was very nice. I have these great memories. And uh, traditionally, you know, you. traditionally <laughs> you know, in every family, especially in the Asiago area, there is 
a specific uh, Casello or producer that they like. But one thing is to notice is that uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, the co-ops in the area, uh, the farmers are bounded together form co-ops because uh, the availability of the milk creates that we're able to work with the milk that we're having. Um, there is a specific cow that needs to be, uh, uh, the milk needs to come from, which is a Brun Alpina, or mm -hmm. they call it Alpine Swiss in the, in the US because all the quality of the milk, all the butter fat that the milk has. Without that milk, you can really reproduce it. I just want to point something out in, into this discussion. You know, we, we talk about DOPs, the nomination of origin protector, which is a, a standard that the European community sets in order to protect the consumers and uh, the manufacturers from fraud or anything else. Uh, Asiago, unfortunately, has, uh, um, if you go to a store and you ask for Asiago, you find Asiago from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And that's sad because Asiago only comes from the Asiago Plateau mm -hmm. and it's only made up there. So whenever you shop... See, most people don't know that. Most, but that's so it. Let's, let's explain why it's unique that area because uh, yeah. maybe most people don't know where is Asiago, which level, altitude is that's Asiago. Exactly. So the, 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 the magic happens uh, because there is a combination of wind, uh, of weather, of uh, the Adriatic so, Sea. Uh, the Adriatic sorry. Sea, there is the, we are in the area of uh, the not Dolomites. a very high, high mountain. Asiago is still uh, uh, not very high. So there is, a, there is a, a little bit high, high temperature than high mountain, so the grass is more green, there is more, uh, more grass available, more variety of grass. Right. More you go higher with the, with, the, with the level in the mountain, you know, there is, a, there is less type of grass, there is, a, there is a different. And, and, and of course the milk uh, have a different flavor. As a different flavor. For this there is a, a specific Asiago that is sought after by many people, it's called Asiago di Montagna. Uh, which is made during the uh, Odalpeggio, Odalpeggio yeah. which is made uh, is a, a high elevation at least 2,000 feet. Okay. And the reason why is that is one, it has to do with the fact that it's during the, uh, the moving of care of the cows from the, from the uh, plateau to the mountains where the grass is greener, there's a lot of more flowers. More. And plus it's, uh, it's done into this uh, uh, shepherd hut, huts that uh, uh, add a uniqueness of flavor to the product the way it's aged in this uh, stone uh, right. uh, huts. And then when they come back down into the valley in, uh, in the fall, they bring with them that cheese that was made. And that's oh, wow. uh, Asiago di Montagna. And that's wow. fantastic. Which is fantastic. <laughs> that's you know? fantastic. One of All the right. things I want to talk, I know, get started cooking. Yes, right. let's cook, okay. let's, cook. let's cook. Everyone let's wants cook. to see the cooking happen. We're here chatting. Um, but we can chat while we cook, we can multitask. Absolutely. Where is a good place to buy this in the United States? Because that's something I struggle with. I have seen it in Italy, in New York City. Um, I don't know that it's that easy to buy. And if we can't buy this, what can we do to create a similar flavor? Well, you can't really create this, so the flavor to begin with. Because <laughs> well, you know, nice uh, uh, the, the terroir, the territory defines the product. Right. Uh, in the US, I mean, there is specialized uh, produce, uh, um, uh, markets that will carry the product. Uh -huh. uh, one of them uh, in the US is Italy, so it's easier to find in metropolitan area. Uh, the web is a great tool because there's uh, actually companies that will sell it on the web, will ship it to wherever you are. Right. So you know there's companies in the, the, on the Northeast that will ship the, uh, the product. The product is very delicate, so it's not like they can just bring it in, keep it in the warehouse for many months. Right. It's this is, like this gets you. flown in weekly. It uh, gets flown in, doesn't sure. get shipped by boat. So uh, that, that's why you always will get, if there is if available by the website or the store, is because it's, the, it's fresh. Right, okay, all right, that Absolutely. makes sense. Absolutely, okay, so. Go ahead. I'm gonna talk yeah. about the recipe. Okay, so we start in a saute pan with a little bit of olive oil and uh, we're gonna saute our shallots. Uh, we can also use even butter if we want instead of olive oil because uh, theoretically in Veneto region uh, in the past uh, there was not uh, a lot of olive oil available because it's, uh, olive oil in Italy comes from the south region. So in the past uh, as a, as a as a, as a fat to, to use to cook, especially in the north Italy, uh, we will use a lot of butter. butter. Oh, well, I must okay. have known that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I have butter. <laughs> um, okay, and then we're gonna just simple cut a julienne, our radicchio. The sides really is not that important because whatever sides you prefer, if, if you prefer to have a 
more the bite of the radicchio in your lasagna, or if you prefer to have more something smooth with your bechamel. Uh, I like to have a little bit of bite of the radicchio in the lasagna. So once the scalogno, once the, the shallots is, uh, I say scalogno in Italian, sorry guys. Once the, 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 the shallots is, uh, is um, saute a little bit, we're going to add the Castelfranco. In the meantime, on the side, we're going to warm it up some milk for make the bechamel, and we're going to grate it inside some, can I, Jackie? Yes, you can. Thank you. Uh, some nutmeg. Okay, so I really love to use nutmeg on my bechamel. Always remember me the bechamel from my mom, I have to be honest. <laughs> I love that. Those are the best recipes that, you know, pull out the recipe, that pull out, mm, smells so it good. Is, pull uh, out the memories so, from yeah. home, you know what I mean? It's amazing. Uh, okay, bechamel is the, the, the how can I say, the, um, the mother of all the sauce. So we're going to start with uh, the butter. Okay, um, let me, Jackie, help this, <laughs> all right, good. all right, this. This. This, is, this, is, this is fancy, okay. guys, this is okay. very fancy. Okay, cool. Um, let's talk about uh, um, ingredients that I use for the bechamel. I like to yeah. give you also some quantity. Uh, for one liter of milk, I have the quantity in liter and grams, Jackie. That's fine. Fine? Yeah, yeah. Well, all right. that's okay. So, Get okay. your scales out, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Americans do not do that because I, I, I when know. I cook Italian cuisine, I always like measure my weigh my pasta and all that kind of stuff, and then they're like, "What is this in cups?" I'm like, "Get yourself the scale, everybody. <laughs> Everyone needs a scale." Okay. So, it's fine. <laughs> so one liter of milk, all milk, all milk, um, if possible. Uh, 90 gram of butter and uh, 90 gram of flour. Very easy. A uh, touch of nutmeg, as you said, and a pinch of salt. So that's nice. As a general rule, when you guys are making a bechamel, uh, you always do equal parts fat, equal parts flour. So that's absolutely that's helpful. absolutely. And another important thing is that um, you 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 pour your uh, milk inside the roux. That's how we call uh, yep. when the butter and flour is mixed together. We call the roux. Uh, we pour inside uh, hot milk Always. because it's going to help you to, to not have uh, uh, clumps. 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 clumps or graininess. So it's yeah. going to help make sure that your bechamel doesn't break or you have clumps or you don't want flour. Absolutely. Here. Okay, so we have everything working. Now we're going to add the Castelfranco in the pan. The butter is melting. Uh, here we chopped the, uh, we cut the Asiago cheese in a small pieces and we're gonna distribute in the lasagna when we build the lasagna oh. layer. So this isn't going in your bechamel? No, 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 okay. we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna add on the, on the lasagna when we build the lasagna. Beautiful. So, yep. Okay. All right, well, what about you, Jackie? let me talk to you about what Please. I'm making, guys, because I'm taking a classic Italian dish and I'm turning it into something that you put in the oven, which I hope my friends here don't get upset with me, but I'm making a risotto, but I'm roasting it in the oven, starting it on the stove top. So, you know. Let me tell you, when she mentioned this, I say, oh my God. I know he did. Oh I was actually really God. nervous because, you know, all my friends here are, uh, you know, American Italians, so they're not true Italians. <laughs> And I was like, oh man, I'm gonna be judged hard for this. But I think the most thing I was judged hard for was my, me, we had like a prior call to this, was me actually talking about my champagne roasted tomato and not calling this Prosecco. And they were like, no, 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 that's not the same thing. So I would like to understand because in America, okay, it is the same thing. Like we're all like, oh, I'm gonna have an Aperol spritz with champagne. And it's like, no, 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 it's not a spritz unless it's Prosecco. So, Let's hear Let's the explanation. Let's have this conversation. I can, I can tell you um, the bureaucracy of uh, a name and uh, uh, sounding. And, uh, uh, the, in Europe, we have wonderful uh, uh, wines and, uh, and food products that are defined by the territory. Mm -hmm. uh, champagne is one of them, actually. Mm -hmm. it has uh, a sticker on it. Yes, it does. The, the OCG, the Issue Denomination of Origin mm -hmm. Guarantee, yeah. that means that this product was made and defined in the area of uh, Valdo Bialina in Veneto. Uh, why we don't like to be called champagne? Because it's Prosecco. Uh, uh, Prosecco defines the wine. Uh, and uh, there is a le legal uh, uh, ramification to that. Uh, champagne is the region in France. Oh. Uh, so <laughs> we keep it at, at, the, at that guys. end. And you know, uh, Prosecco di Valdo Bialina is something that is defined from the Valdo Bialina region of Veneto. 
which are the parameters of production are set by the consortium that work with it. Okay. You know? oh. And that's really it's amazing because, uh, especially if you come from that area, every family have the have their own uh, um, vine, uh, uh, vineyards, vineyards, oh, wow. and they pr they produce their own prosecco for for the family. Like uh, you you have your uh, reserve of prosecco for all the year, uh -huh. and the grandfather distribute to every member of the family the prosecco for uh, the wine or the for the year. It's uh, it's amazing. And uh, another amazing thing that uh, never ask to a Veneto person the first time they met Prosecco because they <laughs> don't remember. Like, oh, that's right. Like, that's the first time uh, you've ever had I it. I don't remember. Like <laughs> it's a right initiation of the Prosecco. I right? have to say, I would tend to agree. I know I had it probably the first time, quite recently, actually, back in 2017. And when I, my first time I went to Italy, and I had a spritz with Prosecco, and it was like the most delicious thing ever. And before I went to Italy, it's funny, I wasn't really a big drinker. Like I didn't really drink wine or anything. And then now after Italy, I, like I drink a bottle of wine a day. Um, not really, but, <laughs> <laughs> but a lot. Yeah, especially Veneto, it's, it's, it's contagious on, uh, on wine. Yes. <laughs> One thing I want to point out too is uh, since uh, is a, a wine and a specific uh, grape and a specific um, test profile, you know, uh, you can actually have a vinegar made with Prosecco, oh. which will be, works very well in cooking Absolutely. and applications. I think we have one of those here, don't we? Yes, we do. We do. Right. Is this one of them? Uh, nope. It's in the back. It's behind me. Somewhere. Oh, that's why. Right. Right. The that's one it. that uh, I took it for make our next... Uh, uh, something recipe. special we're yeah, going to show you guys yeah, how to make. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay, really quick on my recipe. I have a pound of tomatoes here. Any kind of tomatoes you got. You're adding crushed garlic, some fresh thyme leaves, and I'm going to take this to the oven. We're going to roast this because this is going to be part of the roasting process of the risotto. I'm going to make a stock from these tomatoes, and that's going to be the flavor and the base of the flavor of my risotto. So wow. I'm going to pop these in the oven for 15 that minutes. That sounds interesting. Jack, right? I, I know. Yep, absolutely. I know. So let's back here. So the radicchio is cooking. Here the butter is melting. It's time to add the flour uh, for, the, for the roux. OK. We whisk uh, and uh, carefully that uh, the flour and the butter didn't get brown color. Okay, and that's is very important. Before we add the milk, also the roux it's hot. Never work uh, with a different temperature. If not, uh, you're gonna create the uh, gloves. Yes. Okay. Which is not a great mouthfeel because you have a. Uh, yep. a, a bite of flour and it's not very pleasant. Yep, yep, yep. So one of the other products I'm going to be using today is Violone Nano. Did I do good? Did I do Excellent. good? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I took a few lessons and then I stopped. I need to get back into it. But I'm going to be using this rice for a risotto today. But tell me where it's from. Tell me about it. Why is it good? Is it good for risotto? It's excellent for risotto. Okay, good. Uh, by the way, uh, you know, the territory where the risotto, uh, where the rice is made, is uh, uh, def defines uh, uh, the Veneto region because you have the mountains, the Dolomites, you have the water, uh, a lot of rivers, uh, so it creates uh, uh, natural uh, um, conditions for uh, raising rice. And uh, the the f the farm where the uh, or the producer where this one came from mm -hmm. is in a town called Isola de la Scala, which has a lot of which you think an island in the middle yeah, of. Yeah, sounds of, really beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> it's Isola because a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of water around it, which okay. is where, where you need to do rice. But you know the uniqueness is the mineral, the minerals that are, uh, that come from the Dolomite Mountains mm -hmm. uh, creates a unique product. And in risotto, what's important is the amino acids and how they they are fried. In order to make a creamy risotto, you may uh, use a canaroli. Right. Uh, Vialone is a little more, I uh, will say, not dry but less creamier. Okay. Uh, than that. So like less starch it has. Less almost. starch in it. You know. Okay. So what I've done here, I have onions that I've sauteed in a little bit of butter, a little bit of olive oil. I like a combo sometimes. Um, I added about a cup, a cup and a half of my riso, and I'm going to make my stock. So last week I actually went ahead and made a really nice vegetable stock. I think a great tip, and I want to talk about the Veneto region because I feel like, um, is it, is, are there more vegetables there uh, or is it? Because I know you're, you, you're vegetable fish based, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. curious if that region is, has less meat in it in general. 
But absolutely, Veneto is a, is a region where uh, we call uh, there is the Pianura Padana. So Pianura Padana means uh, it's this, uh, you have to imagine this uh, immense uh, uh, space, uh, green space, oh, where wow. so there is a lot of and farms land. and land. Right. Uh, so definitely we have a lot of vegetables, a lot, a lot. Just uh, mention a little bit about the many variety of uh, radicchio that we have. We don't al only have Castelfranco radicchio in Veneto, but we have different kinds of radicchio. We have radicchio di Chioggia, radicchio di Verona, radicchio di Treviso. Oh, wow. So it's really, really, really radicchio uh, variegato del grumolo, radicchio rosa di Verona. It's, it's amazing. And all com comes from Veneto. Uh, how this is possible? It's possible because in Veneto there is a different area, so we have different altitude, we have different uh, climate situation. Mm -hmm. We have some lake around the Verona area, we have Lago di Garda, so there is a, a specific uh, there is a specific climatic area there where we actually m we can uh, have a beautiful olive oil, oh, well, yeah. um, and uh, and yes, 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 we have a, a lot of uh, vegetables. If, if I can take it from you a second, it's like because the importance of the region of Veneto. I mean, if you look at the region of Veneto, you have an exposure to the Adriatic Sea. Don't forget, it's uh, one of the famous republic of the sea that controlled the Mediterranean in the in the Middle Ages until the 1600s. Uh, which brought a lot of spices, you know, a lot of, that's a lot of ingredients that were foreign were brought in. Mm -hmm. And actually that's why, you know, they may, they may seem normal now, like, right. you know, let's say nutmeg will be using normal, but it comes from the East. Right. So th that added to the culinary treasure of uh, influence. But you have the sea, a lot of fish, mm -hmm. a lot of shellfish, mm -hmm. a lot of, um, uh, so it's based on, on this, uh, you choose. It's like opening a refrigerator. You have everything oh, that you want. I that's like, like you know. that, I like that. But that's you the know. best, though. The I, th I think using, and I think that's what's so beautiful about these different regions of Italy. They use what is um, it was there for them. They, you know, what's attainable, what's in season, what they actually produce in that region and are capable of producing. They're using, and, and, that's, and that's what, what makes it so special. And I that's think. the reason why you see a lot of uh, when you say uh, there's not much beef usage. Well, they eat beef too, but. Sure. Uh, the cows uh, in, uh, in Veneto are mostly used for milking because they have high quality milk. Right. Uh, that's why you have, uh, you have great butter, you have great cheeses coming out of there. Right. Um, so, you know, the, the value of the animal is based on, on the milk that it produces and the quality of milk that it produces. Sure. So that's uh, why you have high quality cheeses. That makes sense. You know, the micro uh, climates that he's talking about, like in the Garda area of the olive oil, the garden actually, uh, between the winds that come from the Adriatic that were warmer and the cool, uh, coolness, creates like a Mediterranean uh, 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 Cancun where uh -huh. actually they have lemons growing there, oh which, wow. which people think is, so you, you experience everything. I mean, that's why travel is important because you experience the food, you experience the, the climate, you experience right. everything. And that gives you an idea of the cultural identity of the, of, uh, of the, uh, of the region that you, uh, or the territory that you uh, yeah. are around. I love it. All right, so the milk is ready. It's hot. Uh, the roux is ready. I'm going to strain this. Okay. We're going to add a little by little. And while you whisk that, I'm going to turn this on and just ruin audio for everybody. Great. Just for a second. Okay, all done. While you made that, I made my okay. stock. Yeah, great. So... After we whisk, we whisk very well, and the bechamel is uh, smooth. We need to continue to cook down for another bo bo gentle boil for another three or four minutes. So you're and looking for it to kind of coat the back of a spoon, nice and smooth, yeah, right? Absolutely. So what, while that's whisking away, what I was going to say about my vegetable stock is that always save your scraps from your vegetables because you can make a really, really beautiful stock. So um, I don't know about you, chef, but I love not wasting as many things as possible. So, you know, you throw away the bones of a fish that you use for something. No, you use that Absolutely to make a stock. Not. There's a lot of different ways to use things, and that's super important. So we went ahead and I made a roasted tomato stock. So what we're going to do before we add it is we're going to use one of our featured ingredients, our Prosecco. And we are going to add it. Um, what's so nice is they come in these really small bottles, which is one of my favorite things because if you're just feeling like it's a rough week and you need a little, little pick-me-up, you can grab a little tiny baby bottle. But if you only need a little bit for a recipe, you can absolutely just open a little bottle and you're not gonna lose all your bubbles. So I'm gonna use about half the bottle. Actually, I used almost the whole thing. 
Um, that's fine. And we're just going to stir this and we're going to incorporate it into our risotto. And it kind of has a really nice sweetness to it as well. And um, we're going to just, once it's absorbed, then we're going to add our stock. We're going to cover it and it's going to go in the oven to roast. It's going to be perfect. Can't wait to try, Jackie. I know. I'm Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Um, and sorry, go ahead. No, no, go, 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 go. go. Uh, I was going to say the cheese we're going to finish with, but we can talk about it after. So you go. Okay, so the bechamel is ready. As you can see, let me grab a spoon. Ooh, it looks nice. Spoon, spoon, spoon. Spoon left here. All, the, oh, there you go. all right, so as you can see, it's a nice, as Jackie said. Oh, wow. Okay, so this is ready. Uh, we add the salt to taste and then once your uh, radicchio is uh, sauté and ready you can add inside the bechamel okay so and this is a technique that you can use uh, with any vegetable you want with any type of uh, of vegetable that you want to create your uh, lasagna okay so the mix is ready of course we need uh, lasagna sheets okay for our uh, lasagna uh, I already made my fresh pasta at the restaurants and uh, we blanch the lasagna sheets <coughs> while he's building his la lasagna yeah. I'm going to actually add in we'll get the build but I'm going to add in my beautiful tomato stock to my risotto, and I turn the heat off. So I'm gonna add in about two cups to it. We're just gonna pour it in. But it's a really nice, deep, rich, pink, red color. And we're gonna stir it in, make sure it's um, evenly coated all the rice. And I'm gonna season it with a little bit of salt, and this is gonna go in the oven for about 15 minutes. That's it. Then it's gonna be done, and I'm gonna show you guys how we finish it up with some really delicious cheese. It's interesting that take only 15 minutes because uh, usually when you cook the risotto, especially in a regular way, yeah. it took longer. So this is a great, uh, great uh, um, tips that you share uh, yeah. if you don't have a time to, to make the risotto on the stove. And it's well, that's what I feel like ends up happening with a lot of people is that they're making the risotto and they're, they can't constantly stir it. So you have some pieces of the rice cooked, some of it not cooked. And I think what's really nice, and whenever I've eaten risotto in Italy, it's always al dente. And that's like, there's a little bite to it. And so many people get mush in America. Yeah. And it's like, I don't want mush. So we're going to wash this very closely so we don't get mush. Yeah, yeah. And that's okay. the quality of the Villano Renano, which is an IGP, which yes. means, you know, is defined by the, once again, the territory is very important because it creates a product that absorbs and, and works very well. And, you know, you may, the value is on uh, the outcome of the dishes that you're trying to make. I agree. It's all about quality. And that shows in what your end result is. Yes. Totally. Okay, back to our lasagna. Uh, we have our uh, a pan, so I like to pass the pan with a little bit of butter on uh, on the bottom of the, of the the pan. So it's gonna help the lasagna to not stick on uh, on the pan. Okay, we're gonna start with the first layer of uh, uh, bechamel, just a little bit on the bottom. Okay. And, uh, and then we're going to add uh, the first sheet of pasta, fresh pasta. Wow, that's nice. Okay, so, and then we're going to build our uh, pasticcio or lasagna in the classic way as every, every lasagna that you used to make at home. Okay, now we're going to add some uh, Asiago cheese and for every Layer, also we're gonna add some uh, uh, grana padano. Let's talk about Let's some talk grana about padano. Grana padano. Yeah. Well, grana padano is originally started in uh, Lombardy, in mm -hmm. a, a monastery or uh, Caravalle in the 1200. The, you know, the monks saved uh, the tradition of making cheeses. So they came uh, with his uh, skim milk based mm -hmm. uh, uh, cheese. Um, uh, he's made in the Po Valley. And the Veneto region has, uh, is one of the, those provinces authorized by the, the consortium uh, for the production of Grana Padano. He has one of the highest quality product because of the territory and the grass and the, the, the quality of the milk. Mm -hmm. One of the things that 
you can see, I mean, you have a, a dairy-based sauce on, on a lasagna. People would say, well, why there's no tomato sauce? Right. First of all, tomato sauce came in in the 1600s, you know, that's... So this is more classic That's more classic than anything, than anything yeah. else. So the addition of Gran Padano, which is, has that sweetness, uh, at least Gran Padano, it needs uh, to age a at least nine months. Oh, wow. Uh, the, the there's three, three ages that really works well. One is nine months, mm -hmm. 16, and 20 months. Uh, nine months, uh, the paste is a little soft, not too crumbly, very uh, fresh milk flavors that come through. Uh, so is the major difference between Grana Padano and Parmigiano Reggiano the, the skim milk, the fat, or it's the production. And the, the production is very similar, but it's the milk where it came from. Okay. This has a specific uh, uh, area where the milk needs to be collected from, which is uh, uh, the Po Valley. Okay. Uh, the other cheese has a s separate standard for, uh, for that. What it changes is in the, in the curing and the location where the product is cured. Okay. Um, so, and the flavors are very defi uh, defined and different. Uh, they're not the same cheese. They mm -hmm. look the same, but they're not the same. Because most people in America think they are interchangeable. I will tell you that. I have worked on shows where they're like, we couldn't get you Parmigiano Reggiano, so we got you Grano Padano. And I'm like, um, well, we go on in 30 seconds. I guess it's fine. But the so it's It doesn't, <laughs> not doesn't the work same. that way because yeah. in the execution of the recipe, it will not be the same thing because right. uh, the other one is aged uh, a little longer. Mm -hmm. It has different flavor profile, a little stronger flavor profile, which means that it will change the outcome of your recipe. This has a, a mellow, sweet, uh, profile that works well with everything else. I mean, there you have to think about it. For every form of uh, uh, Grappadano, there's uh, 60 uh, gallons of milk. Wow. Uh, and in a pound of uh, Grappadano, you have the equivalent of the protein of uh, two gallons of, of milk and proteins. So it's highly, uh, highly continental protein. Um, the, the, the sweetness comes from the uh, sucrose, that, uh, lactose that's in there. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those lactose-free products. So I love if you're that. lactose uh, tolerant, you know, grandpa is actually that's pretty That's something good. a lot of people don't know. No. Which is really... Because of the aging, you know, after nine months, you know, all the lactose is transformed into sugars. Right. And so you don't have the effect that we'll have with fresh with Makes fresh it cheeses. that much more better. Uh, going back to the grana, grana has a v uh, large demographic, but uh, once again, the conditions in the Veneto region will create an excellent product. Uh -huh. uh, one, I will say 60% of the grana that comes into the U.S. comes from uh, a manufacturer that's located in the Verona area. I will wow. not mention the name, but you know, the, to tell you the importance and the quality of the product that comes out of there. Uh, wow. and, and, and you identify the cheese by the typical diamond shape mm -hmm. and the name on it. That's very important because when you're looking for DOP cheeses, like on the Asiago, yeah. On the Asiago, you have a circular with an A. It represents the Dolomite Mountains. That's important because you can see, even on the small batches of cheese that you're getting from the grocery store or the supermarket, right you can see. This is so the cheese, piave. the piave. We're going to talk about this in a little yeah. bit, but uh, I thought maybe I bought something that wasn't actually uh, yeah, because true. You, but because you, so you're thinking about it, it was a small sliver. It says there's yeah. no identifiers, but there actually is identifiers. Right, right here. Pia and it even says piave, piave right there. So, but, you know, People going back to that. that Going back to that, I mean, this one, like TV, tells me mm -hmm. uh, that comes from Treviso. Uh, th this is the number of the manufacturer. So, I, you know, uh, DOP cheeses in general are very highly traceable because the parameters of production have to be guaranteed. So, mm -hmm. you'll f like in Gran Padano, you see over here, it'll tell me the age when it came with the, the first day of uh, production. It will tell me uh, the manufacturer. It will tell me if it's uh, a summer or a winter product, you mm -hmm. know. There's a lot of things I can learn from reading the, the, the skin of the, the cheese. By the way, it's 100% cow's milk. Uh, it's a natural rind. And the paste changes with the ages. So the older it gets, though, you want to you wanna use it for, for a charcuterie board. You really don't want to You don't want to hide it. You, uh, wanna, you don't want to hide you it. You want to yes. show it off. Yeah. You want to show it off. So I think another thing I want to show off is this radicchio again because I love it so much and I think it's a really versatile ingredient that we can use in multiple ways. Absolutely. So Chef and I talked and we, we think we're gonna have a little, uh, a little game here of how to use this ingredient in a really simple way. I'm gonna whip up a salad 
and I want to feature some Grano Padano in it, since that's one of our featured ingredients. But also, what's another fun way we can use yeah, this radicchio? Yeah, I really love uh, to pickle this radicchio, because yes. really, you, you're going to see you the, color, the color of this radicchio after getting in contact with the vinegar. It's, uh, it's amazing. And the beautiful uh, thing about pickling, as, as always, is that uh, you can pickle something now that you have abundance and you can uh, have uh, when uh, you when don't... When it's not in season. Yep, absolutely. That's, I think, So, yeah. pickle uh, radicchio, perfect for your cheese board, uh, for your salumi board or uh, appetizer. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's always great to have uh, some uh, pickled vegetable from different seasons. Uh, yeah, because in it, cuts, it cuts into the fat of the cheese and the salumi that you're having. And actually, you know, like we said, Veneto has a great representation of uh, farm product from salami to uh, uh, cheeses. So it's a, you know, and we want to keep it, everything in the same territorio. Absolutely. Because that's the same qualities and bring out, and they actually work very well from each other. So, you know, they, they add f flavors and value to your profile. Yep, yep. And Jackie, I see that you're going to saute the radicchio, correct? Yeah, so I'm going to go a little rogue here, and I'm okay. going to just like kiss the radicchio in a very, very hot pan. And then once it's done, it's going to still have a little crisp to it. I just want to get a little heat to it and kind of break it down and kind of bring out those sugars and the natural sweetness of it. And when it's done, I'm actually feeling really inspired by the grapes. Uh, I know the grapes are not part of this, but I'm going to saute a little grapes and add some vinegar, and that's going to be our vinaigrette that goes on top with a uh, little grano padano shapes. Oh, that sounds yeah. delicious. How's that Can't wait to good? taste. Yep, okay. absolutely. In the meantime, let's uh, get back to the lasagna. So I build the, la the layer of the lasagna. We're going to close before to put in the oven with uh, a good amount of uh, grana padano and uh, uh, a little bit of uh, uh, butter. So the butter on top is going to help to make uh, the grat gratin on your, uh, on your lasagna, okay? Because the combination of the cheese plus the butter, it's going to make the brown color. Oh, I like that. That's I've never idea. done that before. All right. One thing I want to say is he used a, a, a younger version of the Asiago because it has a great melting point versus an older uh, Asiago, which will not melt as so well. So that's kind of like what we were talking about before, how when it's younger, you can do yes. other things. It's like more versatile. You can, you can play with it. Right. You, know, you, you can, can play explore with it. the different flavors that he has mm -hmm. in it. Okay, so I'm going to drop my radicchio in my super hot pan really quick. Like, I like that you say um, we're going to kiss the radicchio. We're going to kiss it right in there. Valentine just, there, uh, just It's just passed, around so. the corner, guys. Instead of uh, taking roses to your girlfriend or your, your better half, just bring some radicchio uh, Just some radicchio. Castor, that's castor it. Uh, the rose it's or the got the perfect yeah. colors in it, too. Yeah. And that's as much of a kiss I want to do. Like, it's starting to bubble up a little bit. I should probably use some tongs so I don't burn my hand. That'd be good. But that's it, guys. You get a little brown, a little sauteed. Use a really nice olive oil, and we're just going to do that with a few more leaves. And then we're going to make my grape sauce that I wasn't even prepared to do. <laughs> Great. Actually, we have a different, uh, a lot of different variety of, of grapes in Veneto because uh, on uh, it's it's a it's a great region where a lot of different uh, wine also comes from because we have uh, a lot of different variety yeah. of grapes. and vinegar as well and vinegar as well because of course every time uh, you make uh, the wine uh, you can uh, with the uh, with the grapes and and the skin and everything you can uh, you can uh, make the the vinegar out of that so. Here in this case, uh, we have the Aceto di Vino from uh, Prosecco grapes. Uh, and uh, uh, really, really easy uh, pickle uh, uh, liquid recipe. I used to do uh, one, uh, uh, three part of uh, vinegar, one part of water, and uh, half part of sugar. So in this case, we have uh, uh, half liter of uh, white vinegar. I'm going to add uh, 250 grams of uh, uh, water and 125 grams of sugar. And then uh, you can uh, put uh, any spice you like, okay? So in this case, uh, I'm going to use some uh, black peppercorn and some pink peppercorn. If I was at my home uh, in the garden of my mom, that would be 
uh, bay leaves, fresh bay leaves that you can uh, add. There will be like uh, other, other herbs. Uh, so if you have herbs at home, you can add uh, any herbs you, you want. And that's what I think is nice. So just like with the bechamel, like that's a base sauce, that's a mother sauce. You can add flavors to that as you're building it. Same goes with your pickling liquid. Yep, you absolutely. can change it up, you can add different spices, you can put any different kinds of vegetables in there. Uh, so again, these are sauces that you guys can use all the time for many, many different things. Yes, for the pepper, uh, I always like to crack a little bit when I put in a pickle liquid because it's gonna release uh, uh, more flavor mm -hmm. on, the, on the liquid. Um. So right now I'm gonna grab some grapes because they look so nice. I'm gonna drop some too. Because they look so nice and I wanna kind of, um, I want them to burst up a little bit and I wanna cook them down and I'm gonna put them onto the radicchio. So I'm gonna do a mixture of green and red because in my past life, I used to be a food stylist and I made food look really pretty. So I have to still do that in this life. So when, <laughs> When grapes are going bad and you don't want to eat them anymore, just roast them. You can put them on um, a beautiful cake. There's this one cake I used to make called, uh, I might butcher this, but castelnaggio? Castelnaggio? Is that a thing? Have you ever had that? Castelnaggio? Shoot! That shoot. didn't go as planned. Um, shoot! It could be castelnaggio, <laughs> but that's a cheese. It's a cheese. <laughs> so, well, okay, cheese. so it was this cake um, that had roasted, gra like a roasted gra Concord grape sauce okay. on it and it is so delicious. So anyway, that's a really great way to use your grapes. The Italians didn't know what it was, so I guess it's not real. No, no, no. Um, it could be, could be one of those uh, uh, expressions of different cultures yeah, coming together, you know? It could bringing, be. Bringing flavors to the table. I hope it is. That you're making me feel better. Thank you. No, no, it's, it definitely is that, you know? <laughs> so, okay, I'm gonna need some grano padano. Do we have any right cut, cut open? Wow, yes. beautiful. Uh, Look at this block of cheese, guys. And how do you know it's grana padano? Oh, uh, because of this. Okay. This is how I know. Just want to make sure, you know, it's like, you know, it goes. Yeah, you, we need to make sure that I'm actually anything, learning you know? something here. Um, yes, no, this is grana padano. You can tell right on the side, it says yes. padano. And he has a diamond uh, shape yeah. identifier of the consortium, which the consortium is uh, a group of people or producers that set parameters of production, uh, like the producers of uh, uh, the Radicchio, the uh, Castelfranco, or the Piave, or the Asiago. Those are producers that got together and decided to do that. Uh, it's funny because uh, Veneto, I think, uh, created the, the image of, or, or the idea of the consortium. And on, uh, I think it was uh, January 8, 1872, where a priest from the Asiago town decided, actually, no, I'm sorry, the Piave, the Belluno area, decided to put all the uh, farmers of the area, the dairy farmers together, and to protect and create and make it more viable for them to produce a cheese that will take them out uh, and maintain that integrity that they had. Okay. So it was basically the basis of the whole consortium came about at the end. You know, so. Yeah, so basically they realized that together Together they work stronger, well, you know, and you know, by setting certain standards of production, you know, collecting the milk at a specific time, you know, so, but these priests put them all together. Think about different Italian families uh, coming together, competitors, you know, that's, uh, that's a, a task and a half. <laughs> and it, it's beautiful because uh, there is, uh, I'm sure, for every, for every uh, product or for every cup, uh, there is a, a party around, so there is a day where uh, all, all well, the yeah, people get together I mean, and they eat, they drink, it, and they it, have... Uh, it, traditionally, they run business, and, and then at the end of the business, they have, uh, well, like they have in Asiago, in Piave, or in the granite producing or even in the prosciutto manufacturer, they'll have a month where they have a festival based on the product where they showcase the best they of the best it, yeah. and you know, they teach you about everything that you have. Let me share this, we have the Sagre, Sagre, Sagre Paisane, yes. uh, which uh, especially during the summertime, uh, every, every uh, town that uh, are famous for uh, produce some particular product, they organize, they organize this week or maybe the month of Sagra where there is a showcasing of all the producers that award that particular product and uh, there is events, nights, there is place where you can really enjoy the traditional recipe done with the product. Uh, and this is a point that I would like to make is that it's best to travel through Italy and, and express and as, um, experience uh, the great, uh, all these little things that are unique to Italy like the Sagra from town to town. You know, Italy may look small or demographically similar, but 
every five miles you have a unique micro uh, cosm of uh, ideas and, and food and experiences. Uh, uh, like, you know, starting from Veneto, Veneto has a lot to offer because of uh, uh, the tradition from the mountains to the sea. I mean, you have, you have everything covered. I mean, one of the best dishes, or my favorite dishes from Vicenza is uh, the Baccalà Vicentino, which is fish in the middle <laughs> of, the, of the Veneto. I mean, uh, the closest sea is about 60, 70 miles from there. But th that is interesting because uh, the, the, the cod that you use is a particular cod yeah, that's no, no, called no. Sto stocca fisso, stocca fisso and it's dry <laughs> out. Uh, I know that vinegar. The vinegar, Sorry. right? I was a combination here, guys. We're pickling over there. I got vinegar in my face over here, and um, yeah, there's some tears happening. Tears of joy because this food's gonna be so delicious. <laughs> I like how you cut the grapes with a scissor. It was very fun. Very, very, Thank very you. Nice. Yes, very I really realized nice. I didn't have a fork to smash my grapes, so I used a scissor. I'm not against using anything in uh, in the kitchen. So it's <laughs> great, great techniques that come handy. Yes, exactly. All right, guys. So I am <coughs> just smashing my grapes to finish this. My risotto just came out of the oven. If you want to see how perfect it looks it's pretty great wow that actually looks so you can see really you nice. still have it's still al dente yep, you can still yep, see that yep, yep. so it's going to continue to kind of steam and cook and i'm going to finish it and make it a little more creamy with the stock and then we're going to put the piave cheese in, in it great it's finish. actually the the same way that you prepare a pilaf rice yeah. mm -hmm. uh but you brought in a in a really interesting uh, way cooking this uh, uh vialone and very very interesting that's so another great thing to do the to cook the risotto like this is the fact that you don't take a risk to break the grain where you stir the, the rice because uh, when uh, uh, when you break the grain uh, uh, the rice is going to absorb the liquid and you're going to lose this al dente part yeah, and it becomes that's very creamy yeah you know the amino acid uh, will make it very creamy and yeah, 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 absolutely. and that's so a, that's the reason why you will use uh, a vialone nano and non a carnaroli to do that dish Okay. Because, you know, each rice, everybody thinks rice is all the same, but it's not. Because, no. you know, they have uh, uh, dif very different points of creaminess uh, and adaptation to the recipes that you want to make. And, the, you know, if you want a drier ri uh, rice, if you want a creamier rice, yeah. you use different... Depends on the ingredient that you're going to add yeah, with, your, with your rice. Right, that you're going to feature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is another uh, thing that I like to share, that most of the people think that uh, more you stir your risotto, the better it is. But that's not true, because more you stir, more you take the risk, as of we say, to, the break, to break the rice. Mm -hmm. yes. Yep. Okay, guys, I'm going to finish this dish. This is how quick it came together, with a little bit of my vinegar, my grapes, now remember the olive oil that I kissed it with, I sauteed it with, it came out. Um, so that's gonna kinda cut the vinegar a little bit here. And what's gonna really help is the fattiness from the grano padano. So you guys can see how versatile this ingredient is, how quick it comes together. I'm gonna grab a peeler so I can peel some grano padano and shave it right on top. And look how pretty it is too, guys. This is one of the uh, classic yes. way of serving Grand Padano when you do shavings, you know. Uh, uh, a little olive oil to finish. Yes. That's, that's perfect. It. Fantastic. Yeah. Boom. Done. Easy. Keep it simple. Um, I think that's what's important about these ingredients. Uh, they they speak so well on their own, and I, I think it's harder to do things simple. You know, you have so many people nowadays who try to do these crazy chefy things, and it's not necessary. The ingredients speak for themselves, and just execute that. It's difficult to be simple, someone says, so... so it is, I so it agree. Is. But, you know, uh, and that's why you work with great ingredients. It's easy to uh, uh, make great dishes with great ingredients. Uh, uh, I have know. to say, yes, my, uh, I come from a, from, a, from a school in Italy, which is a, a 50-year restaurant, uh, one of the top uh, Italian restaurants uh, in Milan, in Luogo di Amenaglia, and my, my, my maestro Aimo always says, you can make good food without great ingredients. It's impossible, like, uh, it's, uh, it's really impossible. And, uh, and yes. I couldn't agree about. more, because that, and that's what this is all about, guys. It's showing you how important the quality of the ingredients are. Yes, we have experience. Yes, we've cooked in great restaurants. He has his own restaurant, you know what I mean? But it doesn't mean that you can't cook like we're cooking here today. You just need to find these ingredients and uh, learn how to cook with them, which we're teaching you how to do. Uh, and I think also, Learning where we can get these ingredients is key. So 
So like in the States, like where do we get them? You, I know, I went to Chef Ricardo's restaurant and I know he goes to the farmer's market and picks up a lot of great ingredients. So that's a good spot to start, right? Absolutely, yes. The, 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 the problem that at the farmer market, you don't uh, easily find imported products from Italy, but you must find products from, from the area here, which are uh, beautiful and amazing. Right. So. In terms of uh, cheeses, as Francesco mentioned, uh, online uh, right now, I think is one of the best sources that you can have, especially with the timing where we are, the where people don't really want to go oh, inside wow. and um, supermarket. Oh. Um, I, I want to say too, is uh, you know, the importance is even in, if you can go and visit and pick it on your own, I mean, is uh, always trying to find a, a, a shop that uh, brings that passion into, into the product, uh, that takes care of the product and you know, the monger uh, takes his own time explaining to you what the product is. You know, uh, somebody that has the passion definitely has the right product. Uh, for imported product and the uh, Italian product, the DOP product, it's been easier now than before. Years ago, when I came to the Americas, you know, for me it used to, it used to be a challenge finding the uh, specific cheese or specific fast. I would have to go to Italian areas. You know, sometimes it was an hour ride on the subway before you can get there. You know, now you can go to any uh, a supermarket chain and it will have high quality Italian DOP products from the cheeses uh, to the rice. Uh. Here's a question for you, actually. It's w I agree with you. It is way more accessible than it's ever been, which is so nice. By the way, I am grating the Piave cheese into my risotto right now to finish it. Um, about a half a cup, so I got a little more to go. But when I go to the supermarket sometimes, even when I'm buying vinegar specifically, it says product of Italy, or it says imported, imported from Italy. Like, how do you know if it doesn't like, does this one have the stamp on it? Like, what's the telltale sign on this? Uh, this one, you know, uh, uh, vinegar, there's some of them that are DOP and the IGP and the OC. Uh -huh. You know, on this you will, we go with the, uh, with, the, with, the, with the manufacturer, you know, okay. the history. This has been 1921, is a company that has done a lot of work and, you know, selects the best uh, uh, quality ingredients to make the best vinegars that represent Italy in general. Okay. Uh, uh, so do your research, guys. That's that what research is important. That when it comes to uh, to uh, a product, you know, reading, spending the extra two minutes reading the product right. will save you. First, you gain in value because, you know, uh, when you buy some some stuff that it's uh, let's say two dollars a liter, you, know, you realize you know you take it home and then you realize that doesn't taste like anything, or it's just sugar and, 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 and water, basically. Uh, you know, you basically, you know, or like a shaved par parsman, parmesan style that you, know, you put in your pasta and you have to put the whole thing in it because it has some, some flavor. So sometimes the cost of the less expensive item will really cost you more than, than the real thing. Uh, product like this, right there, I have an IGP identifier from the European community, which it tells me that an IGP is a product that uh, finishes or some of the um, uh, parameters of productions are done in a specific area that add the flavor to the product or gives that uniqueness on the flavor, uh, flavor profile. Uh, on the DOP, DOP end, uh, you'll have on the cheeses like Piave, uh, by the way, Piave is a, you see over here, this is a DOP symbol, same from the European community. These symbols were created about 25 years ago to protect ingredients and products that were territory defined in Europe uh, to protect the consumer, you know. Uh, like I say, Piave. Piave is a, a cheese that may look like other cheeses, but it's very unique. It comes from the Bluno area. It's a small little province. It's uh, uh, close to the Prealps, um, a little different than the Asiago. Uh, plateau, uh, there is a lot of more minerality in the milk. So, but the production is that they collect the milk, they go to a latteria. Latteria is like the co op. Uh, once they cut the curd into uh, brass lats, they press it. And, you know, the, the, the skin stays um, closed, so they brine it. They leave it in brine for a couple of days in salt and water. And then they, put it, they bring it to the uh, curing rooms, which between the uh, micro uh, organism that's in the air uh, were, or microflora will create a crust and give a specific flavor to the, to the product. Uh, this product comes in three ages too. Um, same, uh, 
the difference is the younger is a little softer. You can actually make sandwiches with it. You can melt it in um, uh, with pasta. Is that most cheeses? Do they mostly come in different ages and um, where you can, you know, you can do different things with them at different times? Uh, it depends. Some of them will do depends on the on the type of milk. If it's cow, sheep, or goat. Okay. Uh, for example, goat sometimes is one of the most difficult ones. Uh, but cow is a little more adaptable because you get, in the younger it is, you have the freshness and the sweetness of the milk. Mm -hmm. the, uh, as it gets oh, in the middle, you have, it's like a teenager. Uh, and I have two of them, <laughs> so I understand how they work. You know, it could be one, one moment they're young, the one moment they're adults, so it becomes a little difficult. The flavor comes. And then when it gets to the last, which is, in this case, is uh, uh, Piave Vecchio, which is a fine, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the oldest you can get, it's uh, more for grating because it's uh, similar to uh, uh, old gravy cheese. The color on the paste changes to a more stray. Uh -huh. And it has a woodsy um, uh, sweetness into, into the paste or as you eat it. Hmm. And what's more common in Italy, like cows, goats, sheep, or like do you have a variety? Depends of on the them? region. Depends, Depends on the region, region because, okay. you know, this is funny because in Veneto, until the 1500s, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, one of the, uh, was a manufacturing of uh, wool, so they had a lot of sheep uh, in, in the Veneto region. Mm -hmm. So this cheese is, the Asiago de Piave, started out as a, a sheep milk cheese. Oh, wow. Then uh, they brought the cows uh, for uh, meat and milk. Uh -huh. They realized that the milk of the cows uh, had better flavor than the pecorino, because the original name of those cheese was pecorin, which in Venetian means uh, pecorino. So that's how, cha how our tradition changed, how they adapted the milk to, uh, to a new ingredient that they adapted and brought forward those items. So they were testing things they out They were testing back it then. out and so they, were, they realized in the 1700s that, you know, making it with the milk of a cow is better than the, mm -hmm. than the sheep. It gives the flavors because, as you know, with sheep, the younger it is, the better it is. When it gets older, it's a little saltier, it's a little more right. a little difficult to adapt to recipes. Right. And like you said before, uh, to, to the tradition that you know, there's a, a dividing line in Italy, uh, where it's called the olive oil line and, and the butter line. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, uh, it's not because they want to do a war, it's just because what they have more of and they have to adapt the recipes to that. Sure. In the southern part of Italy, you know, they adapt to olive oil, that's the fat that we're cooking with. You know, exposure to from the Greek times until now, it's the way that they learn. Butter, you know, uh, if I think I'm Sicilian, so for me, uh, to see a dish done with butter it was a little different. You know, it was like a, it would so be some, some, uh, something new, you know, right. more used to olive oils and uh, cooking with olive oil. And that's mm -hmm. how we adapt because of the quality of the product that we have at hand. Right. Same thing. So it's really Great what's, dairy. what's at your hands, what's at your yes. disposal and, you know, how you Absolutely. can use it. Yeah. And let, let's back to the cheeses. There is a region, Piemonte, where you can have a cheese made with tree milk. So Ooh. there is the tree latte. Yeah, the tree latte. So there is the Robiola wow. tree latte. They use three different kinds of milk. So really it's based on, on the regions and uh, in what the region have available, you know. And, right. uh, and then you see, like, uh, uh, the Gran Padano. Going back a little bit to the Gran Padano. It's created in Lombardy, but the, the tradition moved forward uh, 200 right. miles oh, down good. the Po so Valley. You're constantly changing and adapting and seeing. You're so the, this. Yeah, the vinegar yeah. is ready. When it's hot, we just add uh, our radicchio leaves inside. And they're just going to melt okay. into it. Okay, yep. So Beautiful. And, and you went ahead and pickled some here. Yes, because you have to cover now uh, and let uh, uh, cool down inside, cover. And then the results, as I said before, is this beautiful uh, uh, radicchio that uh, the color, as you can see, it's, uh, it's amazing. It's looks and the longer pink it and sits, the better it gets, right? Absolutely. Okay. And uh, because we like to use always everything with this vinegar, it's perfect to make uh, your uh, vinaigrette for your dressing. salad, your mm -hmm. dressing for your salad. So there is a little bit of sweetness and bitterness from the radicchio, so it's very nice. Nothing goes to waste. Absolutely. Um, so I went ahead and I finished my risotto. I finished it with the piave cheese, as you guys saw, a little bit of butter for creaminess, and I always save a little bit of my roasted tomato stock to kind of bring it back to life and get that creamy texture going. So I went ahead and plated that up over there. Chef, I have plated some for you. I'm going to plate some for you, Francesco. I think we need to talk about Prosecco. And Federico, come on in. Come back in here. We've, I don't know if you've been watching, but we have prepared some, a whole meal for you. Absolutely. You know, I'm <laughs> so lucky. We are so lucky here. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, it was of wonderful. Course. I think it was uh, 
It was great to see you, you know, preparing these dishes and also talks about this wonderful product that we brought today. Uh, you partially touched, uh, you know, the, um, the, uh, 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 you start talking about Prosecco. So we have a Prosecco here, is, I, and I think the best way to, uh, you know, uh, close this day is to have a toast with, with Prosecco. Uh, but before we open this, uh, uh, let me say a few words about uh, uh, you. Jackie, you made a good point before. You were talking about the difference between uh, Champagne and Prosecco. So, yes. uh, of course, you know, as uh, Francesco said, there is a difference based on the area where the product is, uh, is produced. But also, uh, if we look at that, there is also a, a very important difference, which is the grape. Champagne is made uh, traditionally with three different grapes, is uh, Chardonnay, Pinot Meunier, and Pinot, uh, and Pinot Noir. Uh, Prosecco is made with, uh, with a grape called Glera. Before, it used to be called also Prosecco, but in order to make it you know, easier for people to understand the difference between the wine itself and, and, uh, and the grape, uh, the, the, the grape that is used for Prosecco is called Glera. Uh, and you know, the rule says that you can call a product Prosecco when you use at least 85% you know, of Glera into uh, uh, the wine itself. Oh, wow. You will know that you know, uh, the, the, but the major difference besides, you know, of course, the area and, and the grape itself is the way we make this wine uh, bubbly. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, to make a wine bubbly, you have to you know, find a way of you know, creating or adding uh, carbon dioxide. And you can do it with two different methods. The French, they use something called the method champenoise or traditional, which basically the second fermentation, the one that has the, the bubbles, mm -hmm. it's done into the bottle. It's a much more longer process. You have to add the yeast and, uh, and the sugar, and that develop you know, uh, these very fine bubbles. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's more costly, and it changes also the wine. So uh, you know, if you look at champagne, they tend to you know, also get pretty old. So you can have aged champagne as well. Yeah. Prosecco is totally different. You know, and as our good friend Ricardo can tell you, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not necessarily a celebratory product. Italy, that we have it, you know, in so many different ways. We can, uh, you know, have a, a, an entire meal using Prosecco. We use it for aperitivo. Uh, we use it, uh, you know, when we go out at night and we want to have a drink with friends. Right. Uh, it's the base of very traditional, you know, Italian drinks, such as spritz. Maybe we can prepare something later with that. With that. So, uh, and, and you have different ways of uh, using this, this wonderful product. So, um, Prosecco, it's, uh, it's uh, of course, you have, you have, it's, a, it's a DOC, mm -hmm. so there's an appellation, but you also a DOCG, so you have like a, a larger, you know, appellation, which makes a, a product that's still pretty good. This is an example of it. This is a company that, uh, it was one of the first companies that actually introduced, you know, Prosecco in the United States. They's, since I came here in 1995, uh, this Prosecco was already around. And you know, not very you know many people knew about it, so they they were the first to introduce and, and work on this uh, on this particular product. So uh, now, thank God, you know everybody knows Prosecco in the United States, and uh, and they drink it on a regular basis. So this is the uh, DOC version, but there are two uh, a different versions that you have. You know, they have like a higher quality. They are also more costly, and they come from a very smaller region, and this is the region of Asolo and the Cartezze, Valdobbiano de Cartezze. Those products, they have a DOCG uh, 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 appellation. So there is also something that probably Ricardo knows is the Prosecco col fondo, which is, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's an, it, uh, the, the fermentation, it's still done in the bottle, having yeast. So you, when you open it, you will find like a, a, a little residue, yes, on that. And a lot of, uh, uh, you know, sommelier in the United States love it because it's a very interesting product to play with. Let me share something about this. This is uh, the Prosecco with Fondo is uh, usually the Prosecco that you prepare in the family, you know, because your okay. fermentation happen in the bottles and uh, the family, when they make the wine, they don't have uh, facilities where they can uh, produce wine as a, as a, as a, as a company. Right. So most of the Prosecco that you have made from house, there is always still a little bit of, uh, of Fondo in the bottle and it's actually very good. Uh, interesting the fact about Cartizze and Asolo yes. and uh, I would like to add that we have three different kind of Prosecco. We have the Brut, uh, the Extra Dry uh, and... Uh, um Brut, dry, dry and extra, extra Dry and there is a version that you don't find here in the United States. It's called Demi Sac. Demi -sac. It's the sweeter one. Oh. Also, I didn't finish the way uh, the, the fermentation happens from, from Prosecco. 
It happens in a, in a way called the method Charmat or Martinotti. And basically, uh, instead of adding the yeast and, uh, and the sugar into the bottle, it's done in a large stainless steel tanks. So you, you make a larger quantity. And then when it's ready, you bring it down with the temperature. And that, at that point, you are able to preserve the freshness of the grape, uh, Glera. So it's a, 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 it's a different product. It's a different product that is, is, is designed to be enjoyed in different ways. Wow. So um, uh, that's it for Prosecco, basically. Seems so like you shouldn't be cooking with it, though. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really good, though. It's, a, it's sweet. It adds a nice sweetness to the, to the risotto, right. which you'll taste it here. Um, oh. And you know, Ooh. this is this is what Italian do when uh, when when, when, you, when you when you this is when a good luck. Happens. So you just put a little bit oh something God. behind your <laughs> your here. I need all the luck I can get, guys. And uh, <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna give the first glass oh, to you, you, Jackie. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for your help oh. and thank you for thank you. you know cooking with uh, with us and with this product. Thank you, Francesco. Oh, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Ricardo, for thank you, you for know that. being here with us bringing the Italian cuisine to New it's York. Uh, yeah, uh, this I is really love learning the traditions, you know, like in the States, you salt is you throw over your shoulder, but the champagne on you is just great. I love it. Well, Cheers. Salute. 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 Thank you. Viva. Buon appetito. Yes. Buon appetito.